Welcome back to Harrelson Trumpets. I'm Jason. I'm standing outside the machine shop and today we're going to do a tour of the Harrelson Trumpets machine shop. This is going to be the first of quite a long series showing you how Harrelson Trumpets are made and uh, I want to take you inside to every little step uh, of the design process, the engineering, uh, the finite element analysis, the acoustic studies, uh, you know, the actual machining and printing when we when we use lasers to print and laser cutting and engraving and all the hand engraving and all the hand assembly and finishing there is so much to Harrelson trumpets it's a ridiculous amount of work it's my life's work I've been doing this uh, since the 90s and uh, you know in a couple years we'll be up to our 30th anniversary so I want to show you how it's done in this series let's go inside This is Unit C, and we're in Denver, Colorado. You can see the mountains right back there. And uh, that's where we go skiing. Across the street there is the park where we walk Oscar every day. Let's go inside. Okay, so this is the machine shop. And in reality, the machine shop's a little bit in disarray today. Um, let me set this camera down and I will show you a few things. So first off, we are in the process of finishing a lot of new production for a new series of trumpets and our existing series of trumpets. So this is the year 2023. The Summit G series will be retired this year. So we're finishing up manufacturing the parts for that series. Uh, and then the H series will be discontinued at the end of June. So, which it's June now. So H series is almost done. The X series, of course, is a prototype series that will continue. The Muse is really where people are putting their time and their effort and their money. Uh, so the Muse series, we are full force working on that. And we have a new series of trumpets that will launch in July. We'll talk about that here in a minute. We are going to be selling two of these machines and replacing them with another new five axis machine. So I'll show you some of that. First, let's turn the camera around and show you uh, what we have here. So this area is, let's get a little closer. This area is where we can do, or I should say I could do, uh, custom engraving. So this is a, a microscope I can use to sit down here and work at these stations and do hand carving, either with high speed rotary tools or with engraving tools, so I use actual gravers. And uh, you know, I can see those tools over here. So there's a rotary tool, a bunch of rotary tools. This one is 400,000 RPM. Um, and then we have the graver tools as well. So we've got just everything over here, but graver tools look like this. Um, we, I, I basically um, create different profiles and sharpen them, and then we can do the hand engraving. And sometimes I'll do full mouthpieces. You can see here was uh, something that somebody was working on for fun. Oops, it wasn't mine. Um, but yeah, when you see the hand carved and hand engraved stuff, it's done right here. Um, over here on this side, right now this is my soldering station. And that's simply because um, here in Adams County, we have to have approval to hook up our new exhaust hood. And it's just a technicality. But this is a rolling cart that I've actually used for many years. Sometimes I roll it in here if it's windy or cold outside, and we turn the uh, filtration system on and uh, maybe air it out once or twice throughout the day by opening the door. But this is where a lot of the soldering videos happen. And uh, I'll put a, a fast forward clip in right here so you can see me um, soldering. Uh, but this station is where that happens a lot of time. And I can roll this cart outside. So, or I can take it to the other shop or wherever all the stuff I need to do the soldering is right here. Now if I'm doing laser welding or um, silver soldering, things like that, it may require other steps and some of that's done in other places as well. So this is uh, what's going on here. As you can see, there's a huge pile of stuff right in the middle of our shop. And this is normally where we would come in and load things um, and load stock on these, um, on this stock bin. So the stock storage area where we keep brass, aluminum, steel, titanium, uh, copper, whatever. All the big heavy material goes here. And uh, we typically have several thousand pounds of it on there. Uh, but this pile in the middle 
is actually all stuff we've gathered up from the shops, because we have more than one space, and we're selling it to make room for other stuff. Um, so, and then here we have some raw brass stock that just came in. This is for the new Momentum spinning top, so Momentum 2, and uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Let me set the camera down here and get on the other side. So, in our actual live tours, when people come in and see the shop, like tomorrow is Saturday, um, what, June 10th. So on June 10th, we will be hosting a tour at 11 a.m. If you're in the Denver area and you wanna come see the whole shop, I mean the showroom, the machine shop, the final assembly and shipping and design areas, uh, the prototyping um, area, all those things are available to you guys tomorrow at 11 and we'll be doing uh, an actual masterclass, I believe at noon. Uh, which is physics-based trumpet design. So if you're in the Denver area, I highly recommend you come see us tomorrow. It's free, it's open to the public. And if you're not in Denver, but you know someone who's here, get on the phone and tell them right away, hey, go by Harrelson's shop um, and check out this open house. It will be in uh, the unit F, which is the one on the far west side of the building. And I say that because when we were just outside, you could see it's a big building. We have four of the seven units in this building. I'd love to have all of them. I'd love to buy the building. That's not gonna happen anytime soon, uh, simply because the next door neighbor has two units and uh, he's not going anywhere. And then um, the guy who owns the building uh, has a unit on the end and he, he doesn't wanna sell. So we'll figure that out, but we do need to expand because we're very tight in here right now. Um, so this bar of aluminum is something you would see on the live tour and you could actually if you you know if you have the strength you could come pick it up it's heavy <laughs> um, it's six inches in diameter and I think this one is 12 inches long that bar of aluminum will become a trumpet bell on the muse so we can machine this down into uh, a, a full bell that's lightweight that only weighs a few ounces but that bell would be different than a spun bell and you think, why would you go to all that trouble to turn this into a bell when you could do it some other way? The reality is there are not very many ways of doing it. Um, because what we're working on is creating profiles for bells that can create different sounds. So let's say uh, we wanted to create a trumpet bell that's uh, a lead sound. Then that bell would most likely have a tighter taper, maybe a smaller diameter, and it has some special features to it to make it a lead uh, sounding bell. Uh, for instance, we might have a bell choke on it, which would increase vibrancy. We may also thin some of the material to um, create uh, interference in the resonance because it resonates so much, it moves so much that it creates other pitches that don't belong, and that's characteristic of some lead horns. What if we wanted to take that profile and combine it with a flugelhorn? Could it be done? The answer is yes. If we machine it out and we create the right shapes, then we can make a flugel sounding bell that also sounds like a lead horn at the same time. Now, take that concept and say we break up different tonal areas of trumpet playing into say five groups, and we wanted to mix any of the two or, or any of the five groups into two or three at a time. We can now do that by machining the bell and of course by understanding how to design it to be machined. But these bells would no longer be round. They might be ellipses, they might be somewhat triangular, they're unusual shapes. Because we're machining them, we can also um, create a stabilization uh, design within it, a structure, to make sure that the bell is more efficient than normal, still resonates more than normal, and uh, projects a lot more. And that's what we specialize in, is maximum bell resonance. So. Uh, I could go on and on about that, but that is what this is all about. Let's turn the camera around again. I just want to quickly show you, there's a lot of stock of that um, aluminum under under an old suitcase, but uh, we've got, you know, I don't, I think over a thousand pounds of just that aluminum. And um, let's flip this around so you can see what else we have here. Oh yes, this is something really fun that I'd love to show you. This is our new robot arm. So inside here is an actual robot arm. And we're gonna be setting this up on the milling machine uh, probably in July, maybe even this month. Um, 
I've, I've had it sitting here for quite a while trying to find the time to get it set up. But as you can see, we've got different types of grippers that we can use. That's a gripper, this is a suction cup, and we can build on those. And the idea here is we can automate uh, loading and unloading the machines. Now we bought this one for our uh, fiber laser, so we can laser engrave components and have it automated, have it load and unload, and just keep doing it all day long. But they make bigger versions, and once we've tested this on the milling machine, we may buy a bigger version to make that an automatic process. If we can do that, it means we can make more parts in less time, maybe run more overnight shifts, make fewer fixtures, and at the end of the day, what it really means is quality goes up and the price for you guys goes down. And I would love to be able to build more products for you guys at a more reasonable price, because one of the biggest complaints is that Harrelson trumpets and accessories are the most expensive in the world. Well, that's true. They are the most expensive in the world, but they're also the most highly engineered, uh, well thought out, uh, researched and developed products on the market. So, and, and they're made by a passionate team of people that really care about creating products that you're gonna use. We don't make mouthpieces so that you buy one, play it a few days, set it on the shelf. We, we make a mouthpiece so that when you buy it, you use it for your entire life and you can change it and, and let it change with you. So, uh, same with our trumpets and everything else we do. The idea here is you're buying high quality, uh, extremely well made, uh, handcrafted and machines to very precision tolerances products. So that's the idea. Um, okay, as I said before, this machine is going to be sold. Um, if you know someone who is a, a machinist or wants to become a machinist, um, I am going to set it up to be just a basic twin spindle uh, Swiss type machine and uh, just to run some demos and then we're going to sell it. It's actually been our backup blade and um, it, it's a really good machine. It will do somebody uh, a lot of uh, good. You could make a million dollars with this machine if you uh, were really serious about it. And this is a 2004. It's identical to the one we're gonna see run right down there. Let me zoom in a little bit. So that one right there, we'll see run in a few minutes. And this one, I am going to be selling it for $25,000. The reason the price is so low is simply because it has been our backup machine and um, it, it, it's an excellent, very accurate machine, but we don't need it anymore. So to buy something equivalent to this today is gonna cost a lot. Um, and I have lots of tooling and all that stuff. It's not really commercial for selling the machine, but since we walked by it, I figured I'd tell you. All right, uh, next we have our CMM. And we have two CMMs. Okay, so this CMM is actually wireless. So I can grab this wireless uh, probe and I can come in and I can tap and trigger any points on something I'm gonna measure. And when it's turned on with this laptop, this, uh, basically this sensor system follows these uh, sensors on the handheld and it will follow me around as I do my work and it'll log all the points. It's very accurate, very fast, very easy to use and, uh, and it was a huge investment for us but it's really gonna change things for us in, in the long term. Okay, so next we have some of the new parts that I've been designing for the new series of trophies. Uh, now, a lot of you know the VGR system, the Venturi Gap Receiver, and how that works. So this is the receiver. And that screws on to the trumpet lead pipe and allows you to adjust the, uh, the gap, the uh, Venturi, and overall the impedance. The idea here is with this system, we can find the right match for you to uh, match your impedance in your body to the instrument to create maximum bell resonance. And um, I'm kind of shouting because next door, somebody's running some power tool, which I never hear, but the day I want to record the shop tour, they have to do that work. So I guess I should have told them I was gonna film a video. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit louder trying to say all this stuff, but that's what's going on next door. <laughs> okay, let's move the camera closer. All right, so the next part I'm gonna show you is uh, one of the components for the new series of trumpets. And I'm just going to 
show you very quickly what that looks like. It's got all these milled out pieces. It doesn't look like something you've probably seen on a trumpet before. You're gonna see more parts like that. Here's uh, another receiver that matches that. Here is a different version that's thinner. Let me hold them next to each other. So they are different. And that's because there are two different trumpets in the launch. So we have two different series of trumpets in this launch. One is for commercial lead and brighter playing. And the other is an all around trumpet that can get bright or dark depending on how you set it up and how you set up the mouthpiece. So um, I'll reveal the name and all the information here soon. Okay, so now I'm standing in front of our newest CNC lathe. And when I say CNC lathe, here at Harrelson, we always buy machines that can be as automated as possible. So this one in particular, um, it can make two parts at the same time. And there are two spindles in here. Uh, basically, one can run and cut the front end of the part, and while the other one is cutting the back end of the part. I'll show you inside the machine so you can see what I'm talking about here. So here you can see, this is the main spindle. And as that spins, then um, everything would be cutting on these tools. Okay, so we've got live tools that can, you can see this real small tap and some drills. Um, those can be cutting in either direction, axial or radial. So see they come out this way as well. So we have six live tools, and then we have a series of tools uh, for profiling and facing. And on the back side here, there are actually more tool holders for bar, bar, uh, bar bars and drills. The same exact thing is true on the subspindle. So when we want to pass a part off to the subspindle, this just moves over there and grabs it and brings it back. You'll see videos of this machine, um, and it's not turned on today, but that is our newer CNC lathe. It's actually not new. Um, I'll quickly go around the shop and show you a few things. This is a Schunk Tribos uh, tool setter, and basically that's a fancy um, device that allows us to use really high-end tool holders, and that's important because tool holders really make or break the deal when it comes to uh, being accurate. And I'll show you some of the tool holders we have. So we've got a bunch of different ones. Uh, that's a hydraulic chunk. This is also hydraulic, but this little piece down here, that goes in that big giant uh, tool setter that I just showed you. So that piece allows us to have this very thin section to get into tight spaces and be very rigid. And you can see here's some more of them. So those tool holders are that uh, really high-end system. And here's a bunch more. You can see we just have a ton of tools. We also have um, air spindles because we have a working relationship and partnership with Big Kaiser. So uh, Big Kaiser is uh, one of the leaders in air spindles. And um, we have a couple air spindles. Um, this is a BT40. And the, the machine we're running this on right now is a Cat 40. And then we also have the mechanical speeders as well. So we have five of these and they run right inside the tool changer, allowing us to um, really change the tools um, automatically so that all those things can run automatic. And there's a pneumatic line set up in this machine. So right here, when it plugs in, when the tool changer grabs it and puts it into the spindle, then it plugs into the air automatically. And we have a solenoid that uh, turns it on. So this is the Herco milling machine. And this is one of the machines that we've had for quite a while. Uh, this one allows us to make uh, a very wide range of parts. Uh, everything from braces to um, finger rings. We can do round parts on it, like parts that could be on the lathe, but those are better suited for the lathes. And uh, so we tend to have parts that are round on the lathes and parts that are other feature sizes and shapes uh, and bigger sizes on this machine. So I'll show you a couple pieces. These are both defective pieces, but this is one of the Muse braces. And as you can see, it has a lot of different features. There are some round features and they do look perfect. Um, so those are made on this machine, but overall it's a completely different shape. This would be hard to make on the lathe. Um, 
if not nearly impossible. It, I think I could probably make it on the lathe, but I wouldn't want to try to program it. And then uh, same with this one. This is the lead pipe brace for the Muse. So those two braces are made on this machine. And uh, this finger ring was made on this machine. That's actually a thumb ring, a, a real small one, or it could be a third ring. And this was for the Nouveau trumpet. And uh, it was never put into production. We've never put this on a horn. Then we have this honeycomb, uh, which was also machined on this Herco BMC. And as you can see, it's got uh, a honeycomb structure that goes straight through 3 8 inch brass. And uh, that required some very high speed machining and very long skinny end mills. And that was an experiment. So uh, yeah, that was made on this machine. And uh, why don't we see it run? Um, let me get it set up so you guys can see this machine actually running. So first thing I need to do is get this piece of stock out because I had made a part before and that is still in the machine. So let's get that up close so you can see what's going on here. All right. A lot of people ask me, what do you do with all this brass? They say it's such a huge waste, why would you machine these things when you cast them? Or, I don't know, whatever people's ideas are in manufacturing. Um, the reason we do it this way is one, there really aren't too many other ways of doing it when you're gonna be changing the design often and adjusting things. So CNC machining is really the king of manufacturing when it comes to making changes to designs. When you're casting something, you have to create a mold and then that mold has to be the same one you use forever. Um, so that's the first part of the answer. Let me get that part out. And then um, the chips themselves are actually just recycled. So nothing goes to waste here. Um, everything does get recycled. This is the little piece that was holding on. As you can see, there's a little dovetail on it. See that? So that little dovetail was held in the jaws of this vise. So this vise right here has these dovetails with little grippers in them. And the grippers cut into the brass and that then holds it very steady, very well um, suited for CNC machining at different angles. And what I did here is I created uh, a way to cut on the top of the part and then on four different sides. And when I do the bottom, then I'd have to turn it over and put it back in another vise. This allows me to hit um, five out of the six sides of a cube. And that is the leftover piece. So that goes into scrap and we grab a new one. So this is what we're making. We'll see those in a second. We need this, which I've already put a dovetail on and just have to make sure that's clean. We just slide that dovetail in there. Oh, it's not quite open. There we go. So we slide that in. Let's get a better view here. There you go. And I've got it matched up to these two little marks. So those two little purple lines are what allow me to um, just know it's in the center of the vise. That's the only reason those are there. And now this is a torque wrench and we want to set it up so that we're somewhere between 20 and 30 Newton meters. So if you look real close, the smaller numbers on the bottom here, it says NM, I'm at 25, right? So I'm gonna reset this and we're going to tighten this one up. And it's a simple process. Um, I'm gonna try to do it close up here so you can see me do it. Let's move this. It's not exactly easy one-handed. So what I'm doing is I'm tightening it and loosening it several times. And the reason I'm doing that is simply because it is brass, it's pretty soft, and these little grips can really, really clamp on. See these little tiny um, teeth in there? Those little teeth will grip into the brass, holding it tighter than would be uh, possible with a regular vise. And combined with that dovetail, it's a very effective method. So now tighten it a little more. And what are we at? Let's see. We are at 21. Let's go one more time. Okay, so we got it up to, 
what's it say? Almost 30. Like 27, 28. Okay. I'm doing my best to hold the camera here. Uh, now it's in there. It's nice and tight. You know, I could hit that with a hammer and it's probably not going to go anywhere. But I'm not going to because I don't want to break my expensive vise. Next thing I want to do is come over to the machine and we're going to um, review the part and make sure that we have all the right tools. So I'm going to click on G54. So it's a 2023 third brace. I'll zoom in there so you can see it. So it's this one right here. And now I'm going to click uh, review on my keyboard and nothing happened. Let's go back and try it again. Program G54 review. Okay, tool setup. Nope. There it is. So now I've got all the tools that are used on this part. So I need all of these tools in the machine and it says auto, which means all six of these tools are already in the tool carousel. And the tool carousel is actually right up in here. So let's look up in there and see what they look like. So they're up inside there. Um, and that's pretty simple. Now, if I wanna make sure I've got the right program, I can push draw. And now the computer is going to draw out the tool path. Technically, I could actually draw out the solid model, but I really want to see the toolpath more than the solid model. So the solid model looks really nice because it looks like a finished part, uh, but the toolpath is more important. All these yellow lines are telling me the tool is coming down at rapid, so very fast, and I want to know where those go because on my machine, if I'm not careful, I could have a tool wrap it down and run into one of these fixtures. I don't want it to run into the part or the vise or anything else. So all those yellow lines tell me where it's going to wrap it, and all the pink lines are telling me where it's going to be moving at a specific feed rate that's slower, the cutting feed rate. So um, I need to know the difference. And we'll get back in here and show you one more time. That is why I have um, the, ye the, the rapids is yellow. So that looks fine to me. We're going to push auto. Let me zoom out here. And I've got it selected. I'm going to push run program, push press start. And now it says current tool is zero. Verify empty spindle and press cycle start. That is a Herco safety measure. So basically they want me to make sure there's no tool in the spindle because if there were and I loaded another tool, there's going to be a collision at some point where two tools are going to run into each other. So we know it's zero. And again, that's just kind of a Herco feature. And now we're going to push the start button. So I'm gonna back off here a little bit so you can see what happens. And then we'll get up close. Um, normally this green light would be flashing, but since this is a 2011 machine, one that we should probably replace in a few years, the light burned out. So we don't see it, but I'm gonna push it. It's moving to home and now it's changing the tool. And now it's going to cut. All right, so let's get in there so we can see it. And that was it. And now it's gonna change the tool. Next, we have a drill. So let's get in there and see that. Okay, so pretty good so far. Okay, so most of the noise is done. It's still gonna be loud, but I don't need these anymore. That tool um, is extremely loud, and it's simply because it has so much uh, of the flute hang out, and the, the part is sticking up so high, and the part is hollow. So all of that adds up to resonating frequencies, which is directly related to what we do here at Harrelson Trumpets, 
we are always trying to find the best resonance and in machining we're actually trying to prevent resonance so uh, it's really cool because in you know in my career I spend a lot of time trying to create the most resonance possible in one area and in the other I try to eliminate it entirely so I've kind of become an expert on both sides of that field which uh, you know talking to other machinists and other musical instrument builders it's kind of a rare thing very few people actually get to see both sides of that it's a lot of fun so I'm going to talk a little bit about the parts uh, that we are making right now let me get this straight again so what we are making at this very moment is one of these little braces and this little brace is for the muse trumpet so it looks like this when it comes off the machine I'll hold it up a little closer so that's what it looks like and you can see it's got a very very nice finish so even though that tool made a lot of noise uh, the final finish is very very nice and um, I could actually prevent the noise by using a, a thicker bigger end mill but then we'd have a transition from perfect finish to slightly imperfect and uh, that just creates problems when it comes time to do the hand finishing but that is the third brace and you can see there's a, a tapped hole in here and that is for a screw for the third slide screw stop uh, the other part that we just finished making a bunch of is the first slide uh, receiver and also a brace it's a combination for the muse trumpet so that's this one right here and this part uh, has this specific version has been hollowed out a little bit on the back side. This would be the side you don't see. Um, right here would actually be um, the first slide. And well, it'd be the first slide this way. And then this would be the, the third slide. Let's see, it actually goes this way. So this would be the first slide right here. This would be the receiver for the bell crook. The third slide would be over here. Um, I misspoke there. So the bell crook actually comes in and out of this little tube, which has been precision reams, and uh, that's where we hold the bell choke. And you'll see that in another video, but that's how we create more or less vibrancy in any of the bells on the Muse. Now let's look close at this entire array of parts, because it's, it's somewhat impressive. Look at the surface finish of these. So I'm slightly biased, but I think it's really, really beautiful to see all of these Muse trumpet parts all in one spot, just set up so beautifully. The goal right now is to have the Muse trumpet in full production, uh, which it is. So right now we're working on the next 60 Muse trumpet builds. Now we're not going to put them all together at once. But throughout this year, we're gonna be putting together probably 30 to 40 of them. And then next year, the remainder. The Muse MMXX is a limited edition of uh, 100 pieces. So we actually made more parts than will be in that series. And as the series changes to the next version, um, some of these parts will be used in the next version. So these are the first and third braces. As you notice, some of them are very lightweight. These ones, we made two versions of these. Uh, one with the holes in it that has solid on the back and the other this straight through. So that straight through version will carry over into the next series. Now, the milling machine stopped, which means it's done with that part. And uh, that was very noisy. So if you were here in the shop, you would have had to wear some headphones or um, ear protection, or you would just have to plug your ears. But since that's done, now I can set it up and run the other side. So let's look at it close since, uh, you know, we just finished it. That's what the final part looks like. Very smooth, looks very nice. The little tiny imperfections you see are literally microscopic. I mean, it's because it's such a nice finish that you start to see these little imperfections. Now the previous version of this, before I revised it recently, actually had some chatter and it was not as nice as surface finish. So this is probably gonna take just a few minutes to hand uh, finish, whereas the version before it took a lot longer. Uh, so what we do now is uh, we take that off 
Let's see if I can get this adjusted so you can see. So I have to take that off and then put it over here so we can machine on that side. Okay. Now to do that, there's a little cam system in here that's holding this down. So I'm pulling that out. And now I have to orient it to the G55 uh, side, which I've already marked on this vise. And then I just tighten that with the cam again. And that's what it looks like. So now it's holding it on the side instead of on the end. And for this part, um, I think we can actually run it with the door open for a minute so you can see what's going on. So let's call up the right program. I push auto. I'm going to choose G55. Let's do the extra light version, the one that goes all the way through. I can draw it. That way we know it's correct. And I know it's correct because I designed it. Uh, Jen runs this machine a lot, so she... Um, also would be drawing the part sometimes to make sure she's got the right program and now it's all set So I'm just gonna push go on it again All right run program Cycle start I'll grab my safety one. Okay, so the first operation is a, this is a spot drill There it's done that was the spot drill. Now it's gonna switch over to a, a 200,000 drill. And that one's done. So it only takes a second to, uh, to do these parts. Now we're moving to a tap. So it's gonna tap that part. Okay, that's what the tap looks like. And now it's gonna mill it with a quarter inch end mill. And I'll just hold the camera up close so you can see. Okay, so basically you can see that it's going to be taking um, a special kind of tool path to get in there and remove the material. And this is a, a new thing that came out about, I don't know, probably 15 years ago, but it really had caught traction maybe five to ten years ago. Uh, high speed milling. We've had it for a very long time because we use solid cam, which is one of the originators of these tool paths. Um, but um, it's called trochoidal, or it goes by other names as well. I'll show you the tool path on the computer itself. So we can select view, we can do X, Y, and I can zoom in there. And if I zoom in on this, we can see what that tool path looks like. So basically, it's going in and removing uh, a little material and then coming back out and restarting. It's only cutting in one direction, rather than cutting both directions because a climb mill is uh, where it's moving with the feed is actually more efficient on CNC machines with modern cutters. These are all things you need to know if you're doing this kind of work. All right, let's watch it uh, mill a little more. I'll get up close. So you probably saw it was cutting air there, and that's because in the program, in the software, I set it to be like, remove every single bit of material, but when it was turned upright, 
there was a little material left there and it was supposed to be removed right now. It's actually being removed on the final pass, but sometimes it cuts a little air. That's inefficient, so I do a lot of work to try to remove that, but um, sometimes it's just really hard to remove from the material. All right, so that tool is done. We're gonna change out to a four millimeter end mill. And this one's gonna create the little holes that you saw. All right, so on and so forth. So you can see that's gonna run for a little while. Um, so that is the first part of our tour. Um, I want you to subscribe to our channel. Make sure you keep watching us here at Harrelson and Trumpets on YouTube. And uh, tomorrow's, uh, well not tomorrow's, but <laughs> the next video is going to be covering what we're working on on the CNC lathe, which is this CNC lathe. And that video is going to reveal the names and more specifics on the new series of trumpets, uh, which I think you guys are gonna find very exciting because there will be an opportunity to purchase one of those trumpets at a very hefty discount if you pre-order it. Um, just to give you an idea, oh, that's a little bit loud. And I'm gonna interrupt that for a minute so I can finish talking. Um, so that series of trumpets will be in the $4,000 range. Uh, so 4,000 to 4,500. But if you are pre-ordering that trumpet, you're gonna save a ton of money. And you could even be on a payment plan if you want to. Um, so thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.